What's up, everybody? Welcome to a very, very special episode of the Orange and Black Insider Bengals podcast coming at you live here on Wednesday night. It's a very special episode because of a special guest we will be bringing on in just a second. I'm Anthony Cazenza, joined as always by my guy, John Sheeran. John, what's going on, buddy? What's what's going on? What do you mean? What's going on? We got training camp <laughs> stuff to get to. We got we got a football starting. We got appendectomies to to diagnose. But first, we gotta gotta talk to one of our very special guests. Yes, very special. And uh, you saw that intro in the show. We we're gonna need to splice this guy in here because he is definitely one of, if not the most high profile guests that we have had on this program. You've seen him play for the Cincinnati Bengals. Well, first of all, you saw him play a, a college football hall of fame type of career at the university of georgia you saw him play a couple of years with the cincinnati Bengals. now you see him on espn as covering college football all over the place and he is mr david pollock joining us we're here to talk to him about a lot of different things including his nonprofit organization the pollock family foundation mr pollock how you doing buddy thanks for coming on and making time for us no, thank you guys for having me. And a lot of people didn't see because if you blinked, you missed my NFL career. So it did. It wasn't. It wasn't a lengthy one. I didn't get to spend as much time as I wanted to. That's for sure. Well, uh, you, I, I can personally say I vividly remember you and I are actually about the same age. I think so. I, I remember following you in college. I remember when the Bengals drafted you, and I was pretty psyched about that. And I guess that's a good place as any to start your college career and going into the pros during that time. And a little bit now, but especially during the Marvin Lewis era, et cetera, there seemed to be this real synergy between the Bengals and Georgia players, right? I mean, they just, they love the Georgia players. Uh, Marvin loved those Georgia players. I I guess uh, talk about your pre-draft process and and the exposure of, you know, Marvin Lewis coming there and the visits and the interviews and talking about that. And did you have the vibe with Georgia that there was this synergy that the Bengals just love those Bulldog players? No, nah, there wasn't a vibe, but I think you saw it, you know, pick up and, and develop with Robert Gathers and then me and Odell. And I think you continued to see it, you know, further on, develop, continue to develop. But I think Coach Lewis liked a certain type of guy. Um, I think he liked, um, you know, a certain type of personality. And a lot of us that he picked from um, from Georgia had that. So I, I don't. I don't know that it was necessarily just the University of Georgia. I think he wanted a certain type of player. And I, listen, Coach Lewis was awesome. I, I loved Coach Lewis. Um, I'll never forget. I get drafted. I fly to uh, Cincinnati as soon as I get drafted. I come up and 99's in my locker. And I'm like, hey, Coach Lewis, you know, um, you know, I'd love to talk to you about my number. I, you know, I was 47 <laughs> in college. I, I'd love to be 47. He was like, well, I, you know, we picked 99. I love 99. Well, you know, and I was like, oh, that's cool. That's a good, that's a great number, but I'd love 47. You know, 47 will be, will be better. It would be the number, you know, that I play with. It was like, you know, I coached LeVon Kirkland at uh, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh and, you know, you remind me of, you know, that kind of player. And I was like, all right, 99 it is. So that's how I got, um, that's how I got the number 99. But no, I just think Coach Lewis and um, definitely had good synergy with, uh, with Georgia players and uh, with us during those days. Yeah, the Bengals were kind of ahead of the curve there because, like you said, they it kind of continued with obviously AJ Green, Geno Atkins, Sean Williams, and all before Georgia wins their first national championship in like forty years. How was how was covering that during the season like, and what what do you think of that defense, John? It was crazy because as a Georgia fan, um, you're kind of conditioned to when is it going to go wrong? You know, like. It's almost, you know, we were at number one for the whole season. It's like nothing to see here. Move on. Like, you know, don't worry about it. And I think I think some Bengals fans can relate. Um, you know, sometimes you get close and something crazy happens and um, something that's talked about for a long time. And it usually doesn't benefit you well. So I think Georgia had been on that for a long time. So it was it was cool. When, when Keely Ringo got that interception, I was on the Georgia sidelines near the end zone. And I walked down behind the Georgia bench – from one side of the field to the other. And I'll just never forget. I've never seen so many grown men cry. I mean, it was just, people don't understand, um, unless you're from the South, you really don't understand. Like, this is something that's passed down from from grandfather to, to grandson, like great grandfather all the way down to grandson. Like everybody goes to games together and you build this love and this passion. And you could see, man, it was, all the agony was released, and it was just really, really cool. Um, you know, you think about Kirby Smart 
since he's been there. And, you know, they finished second and then they finished fifth just outside the playoffs, fifth just outside the playoffs. And then obviously to get a, to get a number one, you could tell he had the program going in the right direction. But I think just like every other Georgia fan, it was relief. It was, um, it was emotional. It was cool. It was just, it was fun to be a part of it. And the Bengals almost got to experience that this year, but hopefully now with Joe Burrow in the future, they'll get that. Talking with David Pollock, who is joining us. Uh, we're, we're working on a major fundraiser for the Pollock Family Foundation. We're going to hear a little bit more about that in just a few minutes. I put the donate leak that is live through GiveSendGo.com. It's GiveSendGo.com slash Pollock Family Foundation. Go there. They have a, a really cool event and other endeavors that they are engaging in, and we want to help them out. They've got a lofty fundraising goal. We want to make an impact like we've done many times in the past and kind of like what we did a year ago about this time, but we'll talk more about that in just a second. I've got a question for you, David. You, you kind of teed it up earlier with the LeVon Kirkland talk. I've got a little surprise for you. I'm going to play a clip for you. This is from one of your former teammates from, from 2005 on a, a friend of our show earlier this week. It, uh, he kind of talked a little bit about your time here gave you a little bit of a compliment as well. So here's this, and it'll tee up my next question for and you. Everybody, I think, knew once we drafted David by him being a true, uh, uh, you know, down defensive end in college that it was going to be a little bit of transition for David. Um, they switched him. They kind of started playing him at strong side backer. So we knew it was going to be a transition. But a guy like David, you understood what you was going to get out of him every game, and he was going to play hard. And that's the one thing that he did at Georgia. And when we got him, he did the same thing. And uh, so, so you understood what you were going to get out of him from an effort standpoint. And he did have the ability to rush the passer. But like you said, it was just unfortunate um, with the injury of him. So that was, of course, Brian Simmons talking about your high level of effort, the excitement that the Bengals had when they brought you in. I, I, my personal excitement, thinking back to Marvin Lewis's days with Bal the Baltimore Ravens, it always seemed like he was looking for that LeVon Kirkland guy with the Steelers or Peter Boulware. And I, I kind of was like, here he is. Here's David Pollock. Talk, if you can, talk a little bit about that transition because you weren't doing, you know, you were kind of doing a little bit more of the strong side linebacker stuff like Brian Simmons was just telling uh, everybody about there. What was that transition like? Because you were doing a lot of stuff off the edge with the Bulldogs. It was very, it was very different. And the only way I can tell people is like, listen, I play defensive end and I went to a 4-3, you know, stand-up linebacker. And I, I, people ask me all the time, how was it? I'm like, well, imagine being in the basement and being able to look out the window and that's what you see. And then going to the third floor, I was like, it's totally different. Like the, the view <laughs> is different. Your eyes are different. Um, your, your brain is different because you got to concentrate on so many different things. So it definitely took some time, um, took some lumps. You know, I, I could rush the passer yet because I had done that for obviously my, you know, three of my years at Georgia and, and I knew how to come off the edge. So I was just learning how to play the position and I was excited about it and, Really, I, I, you know, it's, I, I, I've talked to a lot of teams, you know, since then and since I retired and met, you know, like Thomas Dimitrov always used to come on my radio show in Atlanta. And he was with the Patriots then. And he was like, we had you, you know, number one on our board and we were going to put you at inside linebacker. And mm -hmm. so I think there was a lot of versatility that, that I could have brought to the table um, and a lot of things I could have done um, if, if I had a chance. But I, I, I'm thankful for the Bengals because they believed in me and they – they picked me. I just, it sucks to me because I didn't get to give them anything back on their investment. And we had, you think about my draft class, man, you had me in the first round and Odell in the second who only played one year. And then Chris Henry, I think was the third round pick in that draft. So you had, you know, it was a, it was a tough run of, you know, un unfortunate circumstances when I felt like, you know, after that rookie year, we, we had great momentum and we won the division. And then, you know, Carson gets hurt against the, the Steelers and, it all kind of goes downhill from there. And then the next year in the off seasons with Odell and, and Chris. I'm not going to let you talk down about yourself, David, because that season you played 14 games. You started five of them, four and a half sacks. And you were part of one of like the 50 turnovers that that defense caused against opposing offenses. I know fans look back at the 2005 team as an explosive offense paired with a defense that was so opportunistic. Just from your perspective, though, coming out of Georgia, coming out of college, what was that transition like going to a defense where it's like the offense is scoring 30 points a game and we just have to do our best to give the ball back to them? Yeah, I mean, it, it was opposite for me in college. We sucked on offense. Like, <laughs> I, I, would, I would tell I – mean, I remember playing at Vanderbilt, guys. Like, my sophomore year, we were, it was our SEC championship season, 
And it's two to nothing Vanderbilt at the half. And I'm sitting there <laughs> with Thomas Davis and Odell Thurman and Sean Jones. And I'm like, we're over there yelling our offense. We come out and kick a field goal. And I literally looked at our defense and I'm like, ball game. They're not going to get in the end zone. We know that. So three to two is enough. Um, so to go and play with, you know, Chad and TJ Hushmanzada and Rudy. And I mean, it was, uh, it was unbelievable. It was really, really fun to be a part of. And um, the defense we did, we, you know, Tory and company, we, Odell had a great first year. B Sims was leading all of us how to do it. Robinson, Thornton, like um, Delta O'Neal. Well, we had a ton of, ton of guys that were really fun to be around that loved the game. Um, I, I think, it was a defense that with me and Odell, man, I felt like we had a cornerstone of something that could be really, really special because um, Odell was an unbelievable player. And, um, and, I, and I was versatile and I could do different things. And we had known each other so well for so long we could, we could help each other out. So it was a, it was a fantastic season. It was, it was a lot of fun. And it was something that I used to be like, dang, at least we had a good year of Cincinnati. But again, last year, so freaking fun to watch those guys and to watch them have so much success and get to a freaking Super Bowl. Talking with David Pollock, former Bengals outside linebacker, edge rusher, and uh, we're having we're having fun talking with him. We appreciate his time, and of course, it's all in support of the Pollock Family Foundation. We're we're engaging in a huge fundraiser, and we need all of your help. Go to the uh, Give Send Go dot com slash Pollock Family Foundation uh, and donate where you can. We appreciate the support there and we'll hear more about the charity in just a second. Um, unfortunately, I, I guess, uh, you know, I, I guess I will ask you about your injury. I know that brings up all kinds of different emotions and memories and stuff, and I definitely don't want to upset you by bringing it up. But I, I guess I'm kind of curious, uh, you know, when you got diagnosed with your particular injury and, you know, there was obviously a, it's a scary thing the specific injury you had, I mean, was it just like, you know, quick decision? I, I, I am done. Was it, uh, you know, an arduous long play out in terms of internal strife? Uh, you know, can I, can I get back on the field? Or is it, was this just like, no, nah, this is it. And I'm moving on to the next phase of my life. No, I, the first thing I did was rehab. The first thing I did was try to give myself a chance to play. Um, now I knew it was going to be difficult. You break your neck. I mean, none of them forget. They like, they take you under the locker room and put you on the stretch. And you're like, oh, you got a fractured C6, C7. I was like, Oof. okay, what's that? Like a couple of weeks? Like when, when, when are we back? And they're like, that means you broke your neck. And I was like, ooh, I like this yeah. fractured C6 a lot better. Let's stick to that terminology. <laughs> um, so I, I knew it was serious when they, when they said that. I, I had some temporary, you know, paralysis things. And then I go in the halo and I go in the, the neck brace and then surgery and then neck brace and, it, it was a long, long road. It was it was very tough um, to, to mentally to, to make yourself show up every day and and not get frustrated of what you used to could do and what you couldn't do now. For example, you know, I've been 455 in college, and I'll never forget when I got cleared the bench coming out of uh, my neck brace. I benched 135 twice, and the second time it was like it, it was shaking like that. So wow. it was a long haul. Um, I would played football since I was – you know, five years old, something that I've always dreamed about playing the NFL. I, I made my dream come true, but that ain't how I wanted to go out either. So I rehabbed, I gave myself a chance, but um, I was at more risk than anybody else with the with the plates and screws and stuff in my neck and lack of range of motion. Uh, now, listen, I didn't know what was going to come out of the guys. Like if, if you'd have told me, yeah, I think it'd have been a lot easier decision if you go, oh yeah, you're, you're going to go college game day and you're going to go make it in the media and you're going to go make money and your, your family's going to be fine. And you know exactly what you're going to do. I didn't have a freaking clue what I was going to do. I mean, I'm, I, I had no degree from Georgia. I didn't have – the media probably would have been the last thing you'd have said I'd have got into because I didn't really care for the media that much when I was when I was in college <laughs> or when I was in the pros. I was like, wait a minute, why do they want to talk negative about us? But um, so, I mean, it was definitely a tough decision. Um, again, I wish – I just wish I'd have given the Bengals a return on their investment. I wish I could have been somebody because you just wasted a first round pick. And I just, um, I always feel bad about that. And I hate that. Uh, but I definitely enjoyed the heck out of my time from what people told me about Ohio. And again, you're talking about people from the South. So people <laughs> from the South don't really know that much um, about the North, but man, when we went up there, everybody welcomed us with open arms. You know, we started our foundation up there and had so much support and, just so much love. The fans were so awesome. Like 
everything about it was 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 awesome. And where we live with you know Mason Liberty Township, you know Fort Bridges, it was it was it was like home. You know, it felt like home right away. So it was definitely tough to to not be able to you know have a successful career that I had dreamed about since I was very young. I did not know that you lived up near Fort Bridges. My first job was as a caddy across the street at Heritage Club. I don't know if you ever played that course, but that, I, oh, I did. Heritage was nice. That was that, yeah. was, John, that was a little more highfalutin over there, though. Boy. That, that was a little more expensive. I joined Fort Bridges, homie. It was a little less money. <laughs> I mean, you're making that you're making that first round signing bonus, but I, I respect the hustle for sure. Um, so yeah, th- this timeline of your injury and rehab, and then decision to ultimately retire from like 2007 to 2008 and then getting into media pretty quickly i believe it was like the fall of 2008 when uh you began work as a sports talk host and as you said you know you were unsure about what you how you're going to perform in that field what were like areas that you were i guess uncomfortable at first and areas that i guess you you gradually progressed and improved on all the all the way up to becoming a part of espn college game day john i was uncomfortable with all of it like i sucked um (laughs) You know, we did, we did, I, I did radio in Atlanta. And let me tell you something. If, if they had those copies of the reads I did for 1-800-PRO-FLOWERS, like I'd have been fired nowadays in a heartbeat. Like, it sounded like us. Is that the, is oh, that the deal? Dude, <laughs> Valentine's Day coming up, call 1-800-PRO-FLOWERS. I mean, dude, you know, defensive players, we aren't the brightest. Um, you know, it's usually see ball, get ball. So it definitely took a lot of time. But I, I, when I was rehabbing, And I was at home, like in the halo and in the neck brace, I couldn't leave my house for a solid, you know, 16 months, 18 months. And I was watching, just like everybody else, I was watching college football. And I used to watch Mike and Mike in the morning, every morning. And um, I'll never forget, Georgia was battling LSU for, to go to the national championship. And I'll never forget arguing with some of the guys on TV and in my head, by the way, at the house, not like realistic. Um, and, and then I was like, you know what, if, if I can't do football, you know, I think I check a lot of the criteria for media. And I was like, loud, obnoxious, opinionated. <laughs> like, I think I got a lot of the boxes that, that they want to put on camera. So, um, you know, here, here's the deal. The bottom line, Anthony, John, like I knew, like, I couldn't live without football in my life. Like there is no way, no how growing up. If I didn't make it to the NFL, my goal was to be a high school football coach and, and a teacher. But, you know, so I knew I wanted to have football and it had to be a part of my life. And so I think it was a way to keep football alive. And listen, I started at Fox SEC Gridiron Live where it was from 12 to, you know, 2 a.m. in the morning. My mama didn't even watch. So I know y'all, nobody else was watching, you know. So I had to grind and, and I had to screw up and mess up. And, and then when I started with ESPNU, um, you know, same thing. I was doing recaps in the morning and, um, you know, I, I, I'm not ashamed to say it, but I, I was making 12 grand for the year. Like you go from NFL first round draft pick to making 12 grand for a year. That, that's a little demoralizing, bro. Like that's not, mm-hmm. it's not ideal. And so I, I literally remember going to myself, I remember going, dude, you're a freshman in college. You know, you're a freshman in high school. Go earn it. What do you want to do? Go earn it. You want to go do college game day, which was one of my goals when I sat down with a TV agent and he kind of, you know, patted me on the head, like, like everybody did growing up when I wanted to go to the NFL. Everybody was like, Oh, that's cute. You know, so does everybody else. He was like, Oh, it's only the best show. I'm like, yeah, it'd be fun to be on it, you know? And um, so a lot of mistakes, a lot of practicing in the mirror, um, a lot of learning who I was trying to figure out who I was as a broadcaster, just like as a football player, man, you figure out strengths and weaknesses. What do I do? Well, what do I need to work on and make sure I improve um, to now, you know, where you're, you know, I'm so comfortable on air because I've done it now for so many years and built those instincts like I did for football. And now, you know, it's something that I absolutely love to do, and, and especially with college game day. Talking with David Pollock, yeah, we're, we're coming up on the time you allotted for us. We appreciate the time. I, I just maybe another question or two before we hear about the charity, if you're cool with that. Um, I, I'm curious, what is the best? college game day sign you have seen from from someone out there okay I, mean, I, I you probably gotta keep a pg pg 13 i don't know how how crazy some of them get but is there one that sticks out where you go wow that's just hilarious or wow that's creative what, what's kind of the top sign that you can remember out there well i i have one for for me that was very funny um they had a picture of me when i was a defensive lineman at georgia which i was just a smidge huskier um and uh 
and, and, and Georgia fans get so pissed at me because I pick who I think is going to win. And if I don't think they're going to win, I'll pick against them. And we went to Georgia. I don't know what game it was. It was probably six, seven years ago. And they had a picture of me being large. And it said, Fat Pollock would have never picked against Georgia. <laughs> and I love that sign. It was awesome. It was creative. I went and took a picture with the people because I thought it was uh, – I thought it was so amazing, but man, there's so many creative signs every year that just, it's awesome. It, it's its what makes my job so much fun at game day. It's what makes um, that show so much fun, the spontaneity, the fans, you never know, you know, what's coming. You never know what's coming out of coach's mouth. You never know what's coming from the fans. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, we get a bunch of creativity, a bunch of signs, but don't worry about the time. You can fire away. No, I, I I gotta know though because we're we're not gonna talk about we're not gonna talk about the Chick Fil A Bowl from two years ago. I'm a UC grad. We're not gonna talk about that game, but I do want to talk. Hey, my about, wife's a UC grad too. Oh well, uh, you married the right girl. I, I'm very proud <laughs> of you, David. But I do I do want to talk about uh, your trip up to Cincinnati this past fall. I was there along with I'm assuming thirty thousand UC students. It kind of felt like what was, what was that atmosphere like? Because you've gone to smaller schools before to do game day. But for a school that was trying to you know, break its way into the Power Five conversation, what was the atmosphere like for you? It was awesome. I mean, it was awesome. And, and, and listen, I, I, it's per, it was personal for me, too. It's the second time I've been back. But I did all my rehab at, at UC with Bob Mangino. Um, you know, I, and I, I remember being in the pool over there. And where I did 135 twice was in UC's weight room. Like, so vivid, vivid memories. But, I mean, just to watch what Fickle's built, too. Fickle's my kind of guy, man. I mean, just – no nonsense, defensive linemen, like we're not pretty, we're not wearing suits, we're just about work. Like we're just about, you know, grinding. And I, and I love that about um, about Luke and I love their blue collar program, how hard they play, but the fans were unreal. They showed up, showed out. It was the best crowd we had last year and it wasn't close. Everybody um, would tell you that. So it was definitely, th those are the ones for me, guys. Those are the ones that, are the most fun when we went to James Madison and North Dakota state and South Dakota state, like it's just different. The fans are the fans, the fans don't take it for granted. So to speak, you know, you go to Bama, it's like, yeah, you're supposed to be here. You know, like you, you go to those places and it's like, dude, thank you so much. I never thought I'd see college game day. And um, so those are the ones that really stick in all of our heads of atmospheres and cool things that we've done. And we've done, you know, we went to San Diego on a, on a, and uh, the, the the San Diego uh, aircraft ca or carrier, like on the water, that was mm -hmm. freaking fantastic. You know, we've went all over the country, and that was definitely one of those that I promise you, everybody on our show remembers. What? So, based on when you played college football, I won't count the years. The last time you played, and today's college football landscape, there are a couple of differences. You've got teams bolting like where I live in Southern California, two of the major football programs are talking about bolting to a different conference, which is a little jarring. And then of course you've got the NIL stuff going on. I, it's just kind of a broad question, but just the changes you have witnessed in college football since when you were a player and what you see now, maybe likes, dislikes, any of that sort of thing. Cause obviously there are major differences from a decade ago. Oh, yeah. I mean, major differences to, you know, I, I wasn't even a part of the playoffs. That would have been nice. Uh, it actually would have been really nice as a Georgia football player in 02, 03 to get some of them Buckeyes. That would have been a great – because we were we were three that year. Miami was – you guys were one and two with Miami. And to, to think of having a 14 playoff, that would have been um, a lot of fun. But, man, it's night and day different. Now, that being said, it's still an awesome game. It's an awesome sport. Um, the NIL is crazy. Um, now, listen, I'll, I'll say this, and, and I can say this with confidence with the Buckeye fans, too. Like, it stands for now it's legal. Like, <laughs> Ohio State and Georgia and Bama, like, they, they, listen, the rules have been skirted for years. Like, that's been a part of the business of college football. But now, like, name, image, and likeness, again, that was created to capitalize on having a successful career. It wasn't created to recruit people to schools and pay people to come to schools, you know. And so that's that's not what I I don't love the NIL, but again, the kids need to be compensated more with the big business of it's in college football. The transfer portal sucks because th there needs to be an, a starting point and an ending point. Like I just I, I, I okay, here's an example. I went to Georgia 
which was 45 minutes down the road, dude, 45 minutes. <laughs> and I was ready to come home. Like I was homesick. Like it's, it's just something different. It's something new. And, and so that's what happens. You know, when that stuff happens as a kid, you kind of want to leave. And so I think there should, I don't think you should have to recruit your roster throughout a year and say, man, I'm trying to hold on to this guy throughout the season. So he doesn't leave. You know, I think that's, you know, if we could have a, that as soon as the season starts, the transfer portal closes, and then after the season opens back up, you know, and then after spring or before after spring ball, it opens up, and then it closes before the season. You know, having having a way to kind of mandate it, but a lot of shifts, a lot of change. I mean, I can't I can't imagine watching Ohio State play Southern Cal in in you know in Columbus in four inches of snow, and then the next week they're playing UCLA, you know, in California, and it's seventy seven. I mean, like, <laughs> how nuts is that? But it's not about rivals. It's about big business. And it's about yeah. people that are running these organizations. They're running it like big business. And how do I ensure longevity? How do I ensure money way down the road? How do I make sure that my my school is taken care of, not just in football, but in basketball, baseball, in track and field, in Olympic sports, all that stuff. And so what now is happening is who's going to make me money? in USC, UCLA, like, they're going to be guaranteed money and so much money with the Big Ten that it makes a lot of sense. So a lot of traditions, rivalries, geography, you know, kind of thrown out the window. Um, and, I, and I worry about what happens to the others, the others. Like we are going to go to super conferences at some point. I don't know how many it will be, three or four, but what about the others? I mean, those, those people built a tradition and played college football for a long time. And sure, they might not be in the in the race every year to win a national championship, but man, they built a, a program and they have traditions and they have lineage and history and kids that play there and have had success. So I just, I hope we find a way to make sure we continue to, to keep everybody, you know, playing football and supporting the lower levels of football, even though it's not the big money maker. We have been talking with David Pollock, former Georgia Bulldog, former Cincinnati Bengal, and now current ESPN college game day, college football extraordinaire. But David, you, you come on here promoting your own foundation, the Pollock Family Foundation. Uh, talk a little bit about what, what you guys do and what, what the purpose is and, and, and how people can, can can donate and contribute to the cause. Yeah, we had a, uh, the Empower Foundation when we were in Ohio and did some cool things with David's Locker where we you know had jackets and shoes and socks and stuff for kids that needed it. Well, when I came to Georgia, me and my wife, when we came back, wanted to do something with our family. And childhood obesity was always something. You know, I talked about the, the girl that made the sign that said Fat Pollock, but I never picked against Georgia. I, I was always a big kid growing up and had body image issues and stuff like that. And I'm not going to get into all that. But the bottom line is, you know, I just there's so much to healthy living. There's so much to, you know, making yourself a better parent, making yourself a better employee, a better husband, a better um, everything in life when you're when you're healthier. So we really promote whole life health. And and what we've become, man, we started off with just childhood obesity, but what we've become is whole life health, which is everything, like every every way you can to keep people healthy. And we built playgrounds around here in, in the Athens area. We've we've done a lot. We've done camps, you know, for kids that have a BMI above a certain amount and bringing parents and try to teach them and teach kids for the first time. to. We, we have kids that have cried riding a bike. I mean, I know that sounds crazy, but riding a bike, uh, catching a ball, like we've done a bunch of stuff with, with our foundation and we're going to continue to do things, um, you know, in the future. And that's, I appreciate y'all giving us a chance, but you can go to pollockfamilyfoundation.com, support us. We have a golf tournament every year and we're doing a bunch of different events. We're continuing to grow. We're, man, we just want to find areas that need things and go and go serve and go plug in. And that's, that's kind of like why we're doing whole life health because we don't want to put ourselves in a box when we see a need man and we see somebody that needs, needs our help that we can go change the world and make a difference, we're going to go do it. Yeah. And uh, you know, and speaking with, with Shane, uh, who is, I guess, one of your directors over at Pollock family foundation, great guy. Um, you know, he said you also do some work with hope 139, which helps, um, you know, I think it's at risk mothers and at, at risk children and whatnot. And now part of the funds that we are helping to raise on your charity's behalf um, not only goes to the endeavors that you're talking about, the Hope 139 endeavor, but also you guys are, have have a big vision for a big community event, I believe in Georgia, a Christmas concert, live music, all kinds of different stuff to help benefit the community as well. So a lot of cool things that you're doing, a lot of different arms and a lot of different directions. 
And we want to help. Uh, we want to help you out with that. And I'm hoping we've already got a couple of super chats. We've already got a couple of donations coming in. Like I said, what we did last year for the Ring of Honor inductees for the Bengals, we, we were able to generate thousands of dollars between a, a number of different charities here. We want to kind of keep that same spirit, keep that same momentum here for the Pollock Family Foundation. All of the money is going to strictly go to this specific charity. And we're going to keep this. I think we're going to long play this one. We're going to kind of keep driving donations and keep this live here, not just for tonight or next week. We'll keep this active for a while here to really try and make a heavy impact here, uh, David. And I hope, I hope we can do that for you. No, we appreciate that. And listen, I, anything you, anything you're, you're felt led to give and you can $20, $10, whatever, we'll, we'll take it and we'll go use it and, and use it responsibly. Well, I appreciate that. And, you know, kind of call to action. We've had, we've got thousands of subscribers on our YouTube channel. We've got thousands, tens of thousands of followers on Twitter where this show streams live. We've got you know, close to a hundred thousand on the Facebook page. If, those people, most, some, all, even if that pool of people can donate a dollar or more, think about the. You know what they want to know? They want to know. They want to know how Joe Burrow's doing, bro. Abdectomy, abdectomy, right now, like the season's <laughs> about to start, man. A great timing, right? It's like, oh gosh. Uh, quickly before we'll get you out of here. I know you're running long. Long term viability. You're an SEC guy. You saw a lot of Joe Burrow, obviously. Long term viability of the Bengals with Joe Burrow at the helm, even without an appendix now. <laughs> <laughs> or pe appendix or not that son of a gun would play without a leg i mean he is <laughs> he is he, he's one of the best players that i've ever had the the joy of covering and he and he does it he does it in such a with such great swag and he's got he's got the ability to extend plays with his feet and he's just so tough and you saw that last year i mean getting hit in the playoffs over and over and over again every time he's getting up the only time he didn't get up was when his, obviously when he tore his knee up but uh, even in the in the Super Bowl, you saw him grimacing and getting back up. And I think, you know, when you got a guy like that under a rookie contract, you know, that's when you can strike the biggest because you see the amount of money that everybody's getting at the quarterback spot. And listen, he's going to be next in line. Obviously, you can't get an extension until after year three, so that's coming up for him. But Jamar Chase, obviously, uh, superstar. You know, patchwork. The, the offensive line was a little bit patchwork last year, but now obviously with uh, investing in draft picks and free agency. Um, it, it could be interesting. It could be a lot of fun, but it's going to be a fun team to watch. It's going to be fun. It's going to be fun to cheer for the Bengals and know they got a, a big time QB that you can keep around for a long time because he's an Ohio boy. I think he wants to be there, and that's you know not always been the case with with you know playing the cold and all the stuff that goes into playing with Ohio with QBs and stuff. But it's really really fun to watch him. And Joe Burrow ain't going nowhere. That that dude is the real deal. And in a couple of years, he's going to get paid like it. Yeah, it looks that way. Mr. Pollock, thank you so much for your time. We're going to do what we can and, and hopefully make a, an impactful donation from a number of different areas to the Pollock Family Foundation. This has been an awesome pleasure for us. I uh, have admired your career on the field and now as an analyst for a very long time. We appreciate you making time for our show and uh, getting to know you a little bit. Hopefully we can have you back on and continue to raise more money for the Pollock Family Foundation. Thank you. We'll do it again. Appreciate it, Anthony. Appreciate it, John. All right. Thank you, David. Thank you. Who day? Who day? What a guy. What a guy. That was awesome. Uh, I have watched him for a very long time. College, pro, now as an analyst. And that transition, John, of him going from that devastating injury. And I know from the outside looking in, it was not a seamless transition for him as he was going through all kinds of different things. But for him to basically dive right into a very successful career after this really terrible thing happened to him, that, that's way impressive to me. Yeah, I feel bad, man. Like I, I know he's he's humble and he's not he's not that type of guy, but I don't think I, I don't think it's fair to call him like a wasted draft pick or anything. I, I don't know. If I he don't. He, like he said it. He said that. Yeah, I know. No, no like like I'm I'm going off of what what he said, but yeah. like everyone knows how talented he was, and right. everyone knows that he was definitely on the trajectory of becoming a really good player we've had multiple comments here saying like they remember playing him in ncaa 04 and he was like a 99 <laughs> overall he was insanely athletic like that transition obviously mentally going from one position to another off ball to like an edge or edge to an off ball it does take some time but he had the athleticism to do anything on the football field i don't remember that much of him playing but i do remember him flying all over the field and he was definitely on the right path to being a great player because it was already a pretty good player when he was a rookie. So not a waste of draft pick at all, David. We would love to have you back on. Yeah, for sure. And 
I, I don't know if I'm going that far out on a limb in saying if those three picks that he mentioned and we talked about last week in the remember when himself, David Pollock, Odell Thurman, Chris Henry, if those worked out the way that their, their flashes were, if those were long-term players for this team or even semi-long-term players for this team, I, I think they would have sustained a lot of the success you saw in 2005. I know a lot of things happened with Carson Palmer and there were some more injuries that that happened down the road there. You had some roster attrition and the whole deal. But, I mean, you keep those three guys intact and their their trajectory where they were going, um, obviously three very different issues that plagued the three guys. But, um, you know, it's just – it's like, man, what could have been if just – because that draft class, the talent that they amassed in that draft class was unbelievable. Yeah, and everything literally just fell apart like so suddenly. Just in that offseason too, it was like nothing could be sustainable and, and it was like – those three were like, like a representation of everything just kind of imploding just out of their control and then kind of set them back a little bit. But absolutely, they knocked that draft class out of the part, uh, um, unforeseen circumstances aside. Well, I want to reiterate, look, I, I, I'm not the guy to hound people for money or whatever. This isn't money that goes to John and I when we when we do this. We are raising funds on behalf of a charity of a former Bengals player that's doing awesome work in the community. So um, John and I are very charity driven. We like to, to do this sort of thing. I know our guy, Bengal Jim, by the way, that clip from Brian Simmons was from his great show earlier in the week, part of the Cincy jungle podcast channel now, and on his YouTube channel, go check that out. But that Brian Simmons clip of him talking about David Pollock was on that episode earlier this week. Really cool episode there kind of keeping with that 2005 team vibe this week. But, um, yeah, I know Jim does a lot of charity stuff. We're, we're trying to do more and more of this and, uh, we are, incentivizing this with some some prizes and whatnot as well some autograph memorabilia uh, i've got on hand and then of course um you know some other Bengals things that we have that we will be rewarding donors whether it's highest donor whether it's you know at random we'll, we'll, we'll kind of figure out the logistics of it we did give out stuff to a handful of donors last year when we did this big project obviously we did some more stuff with the javante woods foundation after the Bengals won that playoff game and whatnot um, we just want to give a platform to charities that do awesome work. You can tell David's an awesome guy and he's, he's passionate about what they do there. And so, um, we can't thank him enough for his time. And, uh, I, we, we, we don't like to grovel for money or anything like that, but we like to, when it's for a good cause, like something like this, and we want to make an impact. Absolutely. Um, I, I think what David and his wife and his family are doing are fantastic and just, yeah, just the way that he's kind of gone through life from from playing to now post playing career it, it's all been the right way and we want to reward that and we want to make sure that we're supporting a good cause so definitely whatever you guys can donate if you can please, please consider it we would greatly appreciate it absolutely, absolutely.